passage for tonight uh, in thinking uh, about this topic. And the topic that we're thinking about tonight is singleness. And hopefully it kind of sits a little bit oddly with you that we would uh, include singleness as a, part, a storm in our Anchor in the Storm series because it doesn't quite fit with the rest of the things that we've been talking about. It's not uh, a, a thing of suffering in the same way that uh, disappointment or anxiety or illness is. It's not some kind of uh, virus that someone's been infected with. Uh, singleness is actually something the Bible tells us is really good. So why would we include it in an Anchor in the Storm series? Uh, well, one reason is that it's just something that Ben and I have noticed we've had a number of conversations about with people recently, thinking about singleness, wanting to know a bit more about what the Bible says and, and how we understand it uh, as part of God's family, whether we're single ourselves or we're, um, we have brothers and sisters in Christ who are single, uh, but also that there are unique storms that come along with singleness that it's helpful to talk about as well, to talk about some of the, the hardness and some of the joys that come along with singleness. So that's what we're hoping to do this evening. But I just wanted to um, throw out a few thoughts to get us uh, started in our thinking this evening. The first, the first part of what I want to talk about is um, how is singleness a storm? How is it uh, something that can be difficult or what kind of difficulties can be involved in being single? And one of, one of them is that we are created as relational beings. We're created to be in relationship with one another. That's part of how God has made us to be. And it's a good thing to desire relationships, to desi desire closeness with other people. And when you're single, uh, you don't get what is, for a lot of people, a fundamental close relationship in marriage or in their immediate family. Uh, and so you can really feel like you're missing out in that, that you don't have people that you get to be as close to as other people do. Uh, when you need help from someone, there's not just an assumed person there that has to help you because they said they would in your marriage vows. Um, you've got to ask for a favour every time you need help from somebody. Uh, and you can, you can miss that closeness and intimacy that comes with day-to-day -day, uh, living with someone and sharing your life with someone in that way because of the way that God has created us. Uh, and another way that singleness can be a storm is that not having a spouse or a partner uh, can mean that you feel like there, there's something missing, that you're, a bit, that you're lesser than other people, or other people can see you as being lesser as well. Like, maybe there must be something a bit off about you, otherwise someone would have married you by now. Uh, that's can be, you can laugh at that, that's okay. <laughs> um, it, people, there can be kind of an underlying feeling from uh, both sides that there must be something not quite right about you. Um, you know, we, we talk about our spouse as our other half. And so if that's your other half, then when you're single, are you only half a person? Are you someone who's less complete or less fulfilled than someone who is married? Um, it can also, yeah, mean that you've, uh, you've skipped a life stage in some way. Uh, and that's part of the third thing that I was thinking about in, in the storms that can come with singleness is when you're younger, you have a picture of what your life is going to look like and there's assumptions that you make about the trajectory that your life will take. Um, you know, you'll finish high school and you'll go to uni and you'll meet someone and you'll get married and you'll have kids and then when that doesn't happen, it can feel like God has cheated you in some way because you expected life to look a certain way and it hasn't worked out that way and you have a suspicion maybe God promised you those things because you wanted them uh, so he must have promised them to you, and, and he hasn't given them to you. So it can make you feel like God has with, withheld something good from you that he's given to a whole bunch of other people, uh, that he's, he's being kind of spiteful or, or mean uh, in, in not giving you something that you feel like he should want to give you, that he should have given you. And it can be disappointing that your life doesn't look the way that you thought it would and the way that you know, so many of your friends around you, that the way that their lives look as well. So there's a few ways in which we might count singleness as a, as a type of storm and there are different difficulties that come along with singleness than what come along with other situations in life. They're not worse, uh, they're not, it's, it's not like being singleness is a, is a worse type of uh, life than being married, but there's just some things that are unique or nuanced when you're single that you, that you struggle with. But in a, in a greater way, in, a, in an even truer and more fundamental way, singleness is not a storm. Singleness is a, is a gift, and it's a good thing that God has given to us. Um, a single woman, uh, this is a number of years ago, a single woman about 10 years my senior, uh, who was just about to head off on a short-term mission trip, said a, a phrase that has stuck with me ever since. 
that her singleness allows her to be selfish for Jesus. And I really liked that because it was denying the, uh, ex- the expectation that being single meant that she would be self-indulgent and that she would only be focused on her own needs and, her, and she would you know, guard her time and jealously for herself and her own interests and instead that she would use the time that she'd been given and the, and the you know, openness she had in opportunities because of her singleness to serve God's kingdom, to serve Jesus. And going on a short-term mission trip was one example of that. When you're single, it doesn't mean that you have like piles of spare time or that you have you know, less to deal with necessarily because you know, you've got to do everything for yourself. No one, if I don't cook dinner, I don't eat. Unless I just go on Uber Eats again. Um, but it does mean that you're more flexible with your time. You have more choices about how you can spend your money and your time and what direction your life might take. Uh, and that means that you do have opportunities to serve in a way that you wouldn't if you were single. Um, for me, I don't think I ever would have gone to college if I were married. I don't think that would have been on the cards for me. Um, one great gift for me that singleness has given is other kinds of relationships that I wouldn't have the relational energy to invest in if I did have my own family. So that means that I have friends that I've been able to stay in contact with that I probably would have fallen off the radar otherwise. I love um, my friends' kids. You know, there's some really special families I've been invited to be part of in different ways. Um, And I love and invest in their kids in a way I'd never be able to if I had my own kids to take care of. I wouldn't have the emotional bandwidth to make that happen, let alone the time. Um, Discipling relationships with younger Christians. I have more opportunity for those than I would if I had my own family. Uh, So relationally, you do have more room. And that's a gift that God has given to enable you to love the family of God and to love those outside the family as well. Um, Last of all, and finally, um, my singleness means that all my relationships are more temporary than if I were married. And this is something that I find difficult. There's no one that's promised to stick around. You know, my, my relationships come and go because when I move cities, no one moves with me. When I move churches, no one moves with me. Um, and so I, yeah, my relationships tend to have beginnings and ends a bit more than if I, you know, had a husband in tow. Uh, and that's something that is difficult, but it's actually something that's really good for my relationship with Jesus because I am under no illusions that my human relationships are permanent. I'm under no illusions uh, that I can rely on those relationships in a lifelong way. I need to rely on Jesus. He's the one constant and the one consistent thing in my life. Um, And, you know, that's actually true whether we're married or not. But I think that you can, when you have a, a family, you can forget that. It's easy to lose sight of that. And when you're single, it can be a little bit easier to remember that, Uh, Jesus is my one eternal relationship, the one person that I can always count on uh, and, yeah, the one relationship that will will last forever. And so that is a good gift that God has given me in singleness. There's a few thoughts. We're going to look at God's word together now before Ben comes and preaches for us. Uh, Let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter 20, verse 27. Luke 20, verse 27. Some of the Sadducees, who say that there is no resurrection, came to Jesus with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers. The first one married a woman and died childless. The second and then the third married her, and in the same way, the seven died, leaving no children. Finally, the woman died too. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be, since the seven were married to her? The people of this age, Jesus replied, marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of taking part in the age to come and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage." And they can no longer die, for they are like the angels. 
They are God's children, since they are children of the resurrection. But in the account of the burning bush, even Moses showed that the dead rise. For he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for to him all are alive. Some of the teachers of the law responded, uh, well said, teacher. This is the word of the Lord. Well, thanks, Joss, uh, for sharing and for reading. Let's pray, and we're going to think about um, this topic of singleness together. Let's pray together. Our Father, please be with us now as we think from your word as your people about the topic of singleness. We pray that um, what I have to say uh, would be helpful and true and uh, Uh, enable us to be the kind of church community uh, where people know that they belong as beloved children, as brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, and who know and look forward to the perfect union of Christ and his people in the age to come. And we ask this for his sake. Amen. Uh, We saw Jurassic whatever... World, what is, that, what is it? World on uh, Friday night, and uh, there was a funny moment in uh, early on in the movie. <clears throat> it's not a spoiler, <laughs> by the way. I don't think uh, where two of the characters identified that both of them were single, and they looked at each other and at the same time said, "Yeah, it's lonely," said one, and it's. I love the freedom, says the other, at each other at the same time. And I thought that just perfectly captured some of the tensions and complexities of talking about an issue like singleness. Some of you who might be single might be sitting there thinking to yourself, I'm so thankful for the freedom that I have. And some of you might be sitting there thinking, it's extremely lonely. Some of you who are married might be sitting there thinking, I'm so thankful for the freedom that I have. And some of you who are married might be sitting there thinking, it's very lonely. Uh, None of us have a monopoly on those things. And sometimes we go through seasons and stages of life where both of those things can be true in different measures at different times. The question is, what do we do from the Bible as Christians to think about an issue like singleness, where do you go? How do you begin to think? And what's the point of having one night in a mini-series that's devoted to this issue as if we're somehow going to solve it or, you know, deal with it in its entirety? That's not the goal. Uh, We're opening the door, which is what we always do in this series. We open the door on big issues. But we are happy to do that in an incomplete though sincere way because we want to be the kind of church full of people who are in it together for the long haul. And so we don't expect that this is the be all and end all, that this is the total, totality of things that you could say on a topic like singleness. We expect and we encourage and we want to give permission for lots and lots and lots of conversations like this about topics like this over a long period of time as we walk together through the Christian life as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so what I want the way I want to talk about singleness tonight for a little bit, I wanted to kind of do it in a way that would hopefully demonstrate something of how you might keep thinking about this issue and issues like it with one another on your own, in your small group, you know, as we walk together over the long haul of the Christian life. Because it can be daunting to kind of come to the Bible and to think about a topic, particularly when you might be feeling frustrated or sad, or when you might be experiencing disappointment, right? To then come and think clearly and and go, where do I start on thinking through an issue like this? And so what I want to do is attack this kind of uh, idea about singleness using... Um, uh, uh, um, 
a structure that I'm taking, I left that here, uh, explicitly from this book called A Joined Up Life by Andrew Cameron, where he talks about how to think about issues like singleness and like marriage, uh, like relationships and some of the more complicated things about life in God's world. And he gives us kind of a structure that takes into account the overarching story of the Bible as it centres on the person and work of the Lord Jesus and the new family that he's creating in the church. And so what I wanted to do is uh, have a crack at doing uh, that from, from that structure in a way that kind of gives you some categories to think about if you're going to keep thinking about this together or about other issues like it. So you'll see up on the screen a little bit of a mess of what we're going to think about tonight. And the way that um, Andrew Cameron talks about this is laying down sort of some foundational things that you can think about, that you can place, that kind of create guardrails, a safe space, as it were, to think about issues like singleness from the Bible. That starts with God's character, the God who speaks and makes himself known in his word, the Bible, and in his son, the Lord Jesus. That that's the foundation for how we think about life in God's word, the character of God, our creator and our redeemer. That God is holy and he is good and he is faithful, right? So God's character. Also about God, the creator, and the order of his creation, right, that we are to accept, to enjoy and to protect. The new future that God is bringing his creation and us towards, the hope that we have in Jesus, the goal of our life, Right? How does that new future speak into our current situation? And the Jesus-shaped community of the church that's founded on Jesus' death and resurrection and gives us a model for doing uh, relationships of love together. And then you have God's commands in the Bible. And I love the way Andrew Cameron talks about commands in the Bible as kind of a quick start reference guide. So particularly, you're finding something hard, you're finding something frustrating, you're feeling lonely and confused. You might be perplexed and bordering on despair in your life. And so it can be hard to think clearly and thoughtfully about your situation. He says God's commands are like a quick start reference guide of how you should live. So that as you're kind of in the midst of that chaotic thinking, you can say, well, whatever I'm going to land on this issue, I know God says flee sexual immorality. Wherever I'm going to land on this issue, I know that God commands do not covet your neighbour's wife, their family, their marriage. I know that wherever I'm going to land on this issue, God commands me to be holy as he is holy. Right? Do you see how that gives you like a quick start guide to thinking about some of these Issues, God commands me not to commit adultery or lust after someone in my heart or cause someone else to commit adultery. They're important boundary markers to thinking through an issue like singleness that comes from God's character and his commands, knowing that he is good and faithful. And so like Jocelyn said, we know that God is good, we know that God is faithful, we know that he makes promises and he keeps them. And so when I feel like he's not keeping his promises, then those boundary markers, knowing that God is good and faithful, will send me back to the Bible to say, well, what has he promised that I need to cling to even as I live through a season of frustration, confusion and maybe teetering on despair? And even as we think that through and think about what it means to live out, you remember some weeks back as we looked at Colossians chapter 3, we're reminded that if we are to be loved, adopted, forgiven children of our Heavenly Father, then wherever we land on an issue like singleness, we know what we're meant to do. We're meant to be clothed with compassion and patience and gentleness and joy and the fruit of the Spirit like self-control. They're the things that I need to prize and cultivate in my life, even when it's confusing or hard. It gives me some flashing lights to walk by based on God's character and God's commands. And then you're able to start to think, well, what else does the Bible have to say? 
And so our other little point up there is that creation, what the Bible says about creation and our experience of God's world, gives us an order to accept and to enjoy and to protect. It's interesting when Jesus is asked about marriage, he reinforces the Bible's consistent teaching of what marriage is, that marriage is a good gift from God stitched into the fabric of creation as a building block for how humans are meant to relate to one another and how humans are meant to fulfil God's uh, design for their good and their flourishing in this world. If you think back to the creation account, remember in Genesis chapter 2, as God creates the, the world, he divides everything. He separates light from darkness. He separates night from day. He separates land from water. He separates, what else does he separate? Species, right? He separates seasons. He separates heaven and earth. And then in that story of creation, there's one thing that God brings together. A man and a woman in marriage. And as God brings one man and one woman together uniquely in that one flesh relationship, we see from the very start of creation that there's this foundational picture of marriage that God stitches into his world not as the ultimate good of the world but as a picture for what God would one day do for all things. As a picture that points you forward to his new future when heaven and earth will be reunited once again and when people will be united to Jesus in the perfection of that new creation that the Bible talks about as like a marriage. Actually, the Bible talks about it the other way, that a marriage is like that perfect union of Jesus and his people. And so what Jesus does is that he re-establishes and affirms the foundational truth that marriage is about one man and one woman united together for life. And that that's a foundational reality of how God has made the world. That's an order to accept and enjoy and protect. And yet... God made all of us gendered and sexual beings. So why would he do that if only some of us will end up married? And then God in his character and his commands and the order of his creation says, even though all of you are gendered and sexual beings, only some of you will be able to express your gender and sexuality in that particular marriage relationship of one man and one woman for life. That's where you can start to say, well, God, is he really good and faithful? Because if he's made me like that, but then calls me to remain celibate and single, what's the point of him making me gendered and sexual in the first place? if I never get to express that in a marriage relationship. Well, the answer is that God has made all of us gendered and sexual beings in order that we might make attachments to people in this world. Even though some of us will be called not to express those attachments in the marriage and sexual relationship in that particular way. And as, we, as some of us are married, the point of our marriages is not an end in itself, as if once you walk down the aisle and are united to your husband or wife in uh, your lifelong union of marriage, you've somehow arrived at the pinnacle, right? But whether we're married or single, the point of our relationships in this world, as Jocelyn's already said, is to point to the ultimate relationship of being united to Jesus forever. And so the Bible keeps talking about marriage as a picture of that eternal relationship, that marriage is meant to be like the entree of which heaven is the main course. Marriage is meant to be the kind of symbol of which heaven is the reality. And married people are meant to to so shape their marriages so that they look like and point to and reflect the gospel And then what are single people meant to do? (laughs) How are they meant to point in their own gendered and sexual 
um, in a created way to that ultimate relationship of Jesus and his people in heaven. Well, as one writer has said, if marriage is meant to show us the shape of the gospel and the pattern of the gospel, then singleness is meant to show us the sufficiency of the gospel. That we're we're made to be gendered and sexual beings, we're made for intimate attachments to people, and if we're called then to live as single and celibate people in this world, those longings that we might have at particular times and seasons in particular ways are meant to point us to the ultimate attachment that we're meant to have with Jesus in the perfection of his eternal kingdom. Do you see how whether you're married or single, the Bible paints this picture of all of us needing to to live our lives in such a way that remind us and point other people to the ultimate reality of Jesus and his eternal kingdom. Jesus affirms marriage as a good part of God's created order to enjoy the way that he has made us to enjoy it. But he also puts marriage in its right perspective. He relativizes it as not the ultimate good, as not the ultimate relationship, as a very temporary thing so that we might not be so consumed with the temporary thing but be totally consumed with the eternal thing. That's what happens when he talks to the Sadducees in Luke chapter 20. You might remember this from some months ago. The Sadducees are those religious people. Religious people cause Jesus a lot of grief if you read the New Testament. The Sadducees are those religious people that didn't believe in the resurrection. And so for them, their religious privilege and position, their power, their money, their relationships in this life is all that there is. And so that's all that there is to live for. And if you stop and think about it for a second, isn't that true of so many people in our world today? That power and privilege, that money and position, that the relationships of this life, is if that's all there is, then that's all there is to live for. And so the Sadducees try to ridicule Jesus in talking about his view of the resurrection, the reality of the resurrection, and what the age to come is meant to look like. And they paint this funny picture of a poor woman who's lost seven husbands. Ask her about the temporary nature of marriage, right? And Jesus says, you don't understand marriage is for this age. It's not necessary in the age to come. Because in the age to come, you'll be satisfied at God's right hand forever with the eternal pleasures of his eternal kingdom and the intimacy of knowing Jesus and enjoying him in the perfection and completion of his new future. Jesus, even as he points to that reality, embodies the relativization of marriage, doesn't he? Jesus, as he points to the temporary nature of marriage relationships and the eternal nature of his perfect future, he relativizes marriage, but he also embodies that as he stands there as a celibate and single man. The most complete human that there ever was was single. The one in whom all the fullness of God dwelled bodily was a single and celibate man. That sex and marriage was not necessary for Jesus to be fully and perfectly human. And sex and marriage is not necessary for you to be perfectly human and complete. It reminds us, doesn't it, as Jocelyn's already helpfully pointed us to, That all of us, whether married or single, are made in the image of God. All of us have equal dignity, worth and value in the kingdom of God. All of us get to be united first and foremost, our greatest identity as a child of our heavenly father, 
as brothers and sisters in Christ. That's our fundamental identity. And so the creation order that Jesus points points us to and the new future that Jesus is leading us to remind us that if you are single, you are not deficient in yourself. If you are single, you are not deformed relationally. If you are single, you are not deprived of the fullness of life in this life, but especially in the life to come. Which means that the faithful and good and promise-keeping God has not withheld his best from you. I'm having a hard time with my throat and mouth today, so I'm just having a little break and doing some editing of my sermon while I stand here. A friend of mine uh, spoke on this topic recently, who's a same-sex attracted Anglican minister who is celibate and single and has every expectation that that's how he'll be. For the rest of his life, he's uh, in his late 50s now. As he was speaking about this recently and thinking about the desires that he has, the disappointments that he experiences, he said this, as someone who has a lot of skin in this game, he said, my desires are not my destiny. My desires don't shape my future the future that Jesus gives me. My desires and longings don't have to control me. That singleness isn't the end of the world because God still has a place for me in his family and eternal pleasures at his right hand in the world to come. That's a healthy and godly perspective. That's not said with any sense of simplicity or glibness, that's not said lightly or carelessly, that if you are single and you're struggling with that, that you are to know that the deferred hopes of those temporary blessings of relationships in this life shouldn't corrode your thankfulness for the eternal blessings that God has poured out for you. And the real and the rich and the deep relationships of love and care that you're still called to enjoy in the Jesus-shaped community that is grounded in the death and resurrection and the rule and reign of our Saviour King Jesus. And that as God calls you to rest in his provision and his protection, He doesn't call you to be content with loneliness in singleness or in marriage, but calls you to enjoy rich and deep Jesus-shaped relationships, particularly in the family of his people, the church. I thought in whatever Jurassic world, that picture of freedom and loneliness is a good picture of some of the tensions that we experience in lots of stages of life and maybe especially in singleness. When I was at Bible college, uh, a friend of mine and I were sharing one particular day that we were jealous of one another's lives. And I was jealous of his single life and the way that he could dedicate so much more time to study and he had the freedom just to go to up and go, to visit friends and to do more social things as I was in a season with one small baby who's not not so small anymore and might be in the room and some of the pressures and challenges of having said small baby in the house. And as we talked about the fact that 
we'd kind of discovered that we were both jealous of each other's situation as it was right then. I said, well, why don't you come and stay and have dinner with us tonight? And he did, and he got to enjoy dinner with us and the chaos of a small baby and the challenges of the evening routine and that sort of thing and my inability, inability then to do any more study that night. And as he left at the end of the night, he said, I'm a little bit less jealous than I was at the beginning. But it's a good recognition, isn't it? Often we idealise the lives of other people and catastrophise our own. And the reality, if you haven't noticed already, is that the grass isn't greener on the other side. And anyway, God calls you to embrace and to enjoy the stage and season of life that he's given you. Singleness isn't a problem. That's not the thing that we need to solve or manage or deal with. Loneliness, that's a problem. Especially especially if you're a Christian and you're a part of God's family. Because we don't want anyone to be content with loneliness. We want everyone in our church to have deep and rich and real friendships and attachments with people that help point us all not only to the shape of the gospel but the sufficiency of the gospel. All of us are social beings made in the image of God for attachments in this life that point us to the life to come. And the reality is that loneliness isn't something that is solved by marriage. Loneliness is something that is solved by a relationship with Jesus. And as Andrew Cameron says, and in a symphony of relationships that begin with Jesus and his people. So let me finish with a couple of words to you. If you're married, don't idolise your marriage or your family. Open your doors to the lives of other people around you. Ask for their help. Offer yours. Take responsibility for people within our wider Christian community. And even if you have dependence in your home, that doesn't make you independent from other people. And fight what can be an introverted obsession with family life and married life that excludes other people. Fight that for the sake of the people around you, but also to point to the eternal family that Jesus is creating. And a word to single people. Don't let the grief and disappointment of deferred hopes and temporary blessings rob you of the joy of God's eternal blessings and the wonderful gift of the people that he's placed around you and the wonderful saviour that he sent to live and die and rise for you. And a word to all of us, in our words, in our actions, in our jokes and in our banter, don't speak about singleness in a way that disparages people or talks down to them or inadvertently swallows our world's obsession with sex and relationships in unhealthy and unchristian ways, but encourage and value and celebrate the wonderful gift of marriage and singleness and the way that all of us get the opportunity each day to point other people to Jesus and the joy of his eternal kingdom. Let me finish with this quote from Andrew Cameron. He says, it may take some decades of patient teaching and new practice 
to change the cultural landscape of our churches and our introverted obsession with marriage sometimes. But Christian singles need to see themselves as happy warriors for such change, not so that they might be legitimised, but so that the people of God might better reflect God's dream for a community where both single people and married people testify to the affectionate community that Jesus is building. And there will be a brilliant outcome if that change can take place. Our society abhors singleness and hates chastity, yet the numbers of very lonely people are rapidly escalating. And our church, this church, ought to be an oasis of welcome and care and community that is rich and thick and deep, that ought to be a wonder for people to look into and to join. What and I pray that that would be the case. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you so much for who you are and for all that you've done for us in and through our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to long to be like you, to listen to you, to accept and enjoy and protect your good order of things in this life, to keep looking forward together to the new future that you've given us in Christ and to enjoy and embrace and seek and cultivate the kind of Jesus-shaped community that comes from being united to him forever because of the reconciliation and renewal that his death and resurrection means for us. May all of us enjoy and protect and point to the eternal union of Christ and his church as the ultimate prize, as the ultimate relationship and the one thing that we want to live for. We ask that you do this for us for Jesus' sake. Amen.